Yo Busio, my name is Sonal Pam, and we are back with part three of reading my cringy Undertale fanfiction and open world. Today we are going to be going over chapters five and six, and the first one is called Nothing Can Be Done. I do want to apologize again for Undyne's voice in the last video. This time it's probably just going to be a lower, slightly lower version of my voice because I can't really go back and forth with the weirdness that I was trying to do last time. So let's get on with it. Author's note, I don't put too much of the game's story in because I assume that people reading a story about Undertale know what Undertale is about. So sorry if you are lost. Yeah, a lot of the main pinpoints and understanding what the characters are really, you really need to know the game if you're gonna understand this story and like the characters' motivations and things like that. And Diane and I exited the lab and we're headed back to Waterfall. Before Papyrus died, he told me, just saying his name made Undyne's eyes start to water. He told me that the human was heading towards the castle. I figured that they'll still be in Waterfall. Listen, Lexi, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that they must be pretty darn tough to get through Papyrus. And everybody is counting on me. I mean, us, to stop them. So, no pressure. I couldn't, t I couldn't tell her that Papyrus didn't put up a fight. I had a feeling in my gut that Undyne knew that Papyrus was too nice to do anything like that. Undyne and I walked in silence for a while until we saw Kara looking, through, looking at a blue flower. This is my chance, Undyne said, clenching her fist. Undyne sprinted up to Kara. Behind you! Kara turned around, pulling a knife from their back pocket with a mischievous grin around their face, ready to strike Undyne down with a single blow. Then Kara saw me, and their grin grew even wider. Undyne summoned her spear. Then Monster Kid suddenly came out from behind the vines. Wow! You got front row seats to Undyne's fight! Monster Kid turned and looked at me, then at Undyne. Kick that cat girl's butt, Undyne! Undyne rolled her eyes and grabbed Monster Kid by the head and dragged him to where Chara could no longer see. I looked back at, Ch at Kara. They were waving and mouthing the word bye-bye. I turned back and ran to catch up with Undyne. Are you crazy, kid? Do you even know how dangerous that human is? You could have gotten hurt, or worse, Undyne explained. I need you to stay away from that human. They've hurt a lot of people and I don't need you getting in my way. Do you understand? Yes, Undyne, Monster Kid said. Good. Then I want you to go to the castle. The lead? Scientist Alphys will make sure that you will be safe there. Monster Kid ran off, then he tripped, but quickly got up and continued running. We continued walking. We should be able to catch up with the human pretty quickly. So not much longer now, Undyne said. So, uh, what do you think of doing as your first move? I already knew the answer, but I wanted to start a conversation. Undyne kept looking at the path ahead. It is, a proper, it is proper in battle that when you challenge someone to a fight that you let your proponent go first, but I'm guessing you mean after that. She looked up at the ceiling and then at me. I'll use my spear and a slow attack to trick them to think that I'm weak. Then I'll surprise them with spears coming from all sides. Yes, there's no way they won't get hit. I could see that Undyne was excited to fight Kara. I'm going to get my vengeance for what that human did to all those people. I knew our use of the word people was a very vague term for Papyrus. We walked up to the bridge, seeing Monster Kid talking to Kara, who had their knife ready in hand and ready to strike. Kids never learn. Undyne ran up to them. Kara raised their knife, Undyne pushed Monster Kid aside and took the hit. Undyne started to crumble to dust. And just like that? Then Undyne made her speech about how she failed at everyone and how she won't give up so easily. I, Undyne, 
will strike you down. There was a flash of blinding white light that filled the cavern, and when it dissipated, Undyne was in her undying form. When the battle began, the cavern turned black and I was pulled next to Undyne. Undyne let Kara make the first attack. Kara ran swiftly towards Undyne and slashed her with their knife, doing very little damage. Undyne summoned her spear and did exactly what she said she would do. When she started with the slow spears, I remembered that I actually was there to help, so I made some small clouds of frost and threw them at the spears So when she was about to throw them. When the clouds hit the spears, it covered them in a thin layer of ice crystals, giving the spears a scratchy appearance. When Undyne started throwing the spears at Kara faster in different directions, Kara was surprised by this and got hit multiple times. Kara's sweater was covered in blood. They looked up and still had that same awful grin. When it was Kara's turn, they focused their attention towards my direction. I wasn't surprised since I was the weaker one out of Undyne myself. As they ran towards me and was about to stab me, I jumped up and stayed in the air until Kara gave up and returned back to where they originally were. Once again, it was Undyne and I's turn. Undyne once again throwing spears towards Kara. Instead of using my magic to make Undyne's spears ice spears, I touched the ground with my hands in a line that went towards Kara. They didn't notice the ice because they were too busy trying to dodge Undyne's spears. When the ice hit their feet, their feet were consumed in the ice, and their soul turned blue. Well, that's pretty neat, I thought to myself. But I had to concentrate on the ice, or else it would start to melt. Undyne threw one more spear at Kara, and Kara's soul shattered. The black faded away, and we were back in the cavern. Undyne sighed a breath of relief. Thank you, Lexi. You really did help. Undyne froze, and the screen flashed to black. When the surroundings returned, we were back to where we were before the fight. Of course, this Chara has the power to reset, I accidentally said out loud. Undyne turned her head and had a questioning look on her face. What was that, Lexi? Oh, n nothing, Undyne, I replied. Still not convinced, she asked again. I said, what was that, punk? I quickly came up with a lie. Uh, I was I was wondering what your first move was going to be. I said it out loud, and when you heard it, I kind of thought it was a stupid question. So, yeah. Undyne shrugged and continued walking. I guess I'd give the human a surprise attack with throwing my spear slow in one direction, then fast on all sides. I couldn't believe this was happening. Was this going to be happening forever? I didn't want to think about the question that I just asked. I knew... It either that or the player would give up or that Undyne would die and Kara would keep moving forward. Or we walked to the bridge and again Monster Kid was talking to Kara. I was waiting for Undyne to say, kids never learn like she did last time. But instead she looked, took a deep breath, and ran towards the children. And again taking the hit, I was surprised. The what I say affect the outcome of the upcoming events? The event took place again. I could see the look of disinterest as the scene took place. Once again, I pulled in I was pulled into the fight. Kara went after Undyne and slashed her armor. When it was Undyne's turn, Kara smirked as they avoided the spears and that had struck them before. Undyne got angry. Kara went after Undyne again, smiling at me as they slashed Undyne's cheek. I made several ice shards and threw them at Kara. Kara dodged most of them, but one penetrated their right shoulder. Kara fell to the ground and grinded their teeth. They realized I was not going to be easy to kill. A little self-promotion there, I might say, Lexi. Kara ran towards me, and right as they were about to hit me with their knife, I slid to the left and punched them in the face since they didn't stop when I dodged their attack. Kara fell backwards and hit their head on the cavern floor. You could have heard the back of their skull crack. You both knew they were dead. The surrounding turned back to normal and Undyne looked very pissed off. Before she could say anything, she froze and we were back to where we were. Again. This is going to take a while, I thought to myself. The same events continued to happen for what seemed like forever. I remember jumping off the bridge at some point, just wanting to give up. But, uh... When I respawned back, beside Undyne, I was so relieved that 
and Dine could take care of herself for once. As the battle kept restarting, and Dine became more and more determined to strike them down alone. I think it was about the 237th time when I started becoming predictable. That was a mistake. This is there's only so much you can do with ice magic, especially when you're teaming up with someone as intimidating as Dine, who really wanted to get the credit for killing Kara without any help. The battle began the same as the others. Kara dodged all of Undyne's moves and seemed to barely even try on mine. Kara would no longer come after me for attacks, just slashing Undyne over and over again until there were only a couple more slashes, then Undyne would be done and fade out of existence. I gave my all in this battle, but Undyne kept pushing me out of the way when I tried to make an attack on Kara. It was the last time that got me the most. I, I didn't want Undyne to die. Right before Kara stabbed Undyne, I, I jumped to get in the way of the blow. Undyne quickly realized this and yelled, This isn't your fight! She pushed me away and took her final hit. I started to cry as she shattered into a million pieces. Kara smiled as so wide it made me feel sick to my stomach. As they walked away, Kara turned to me and said, Well, better luck next time, huh? Then they just continued forward. I looked down at the cavern bottom, dangling my legs off the bridge, thinking how I failed everyone. Did you really think it was possible? I said to myself. I mean, really. It's not like you'll ever be that special little snowflake that would save everyone. You never are. Don't be so hard on yourself, kid. I looked back and saw Sand standing behind me. She wouldn't let me help, I said. I know. It's in her code, Sand replied. Yeah, but I thought maybe it would change. I looked back down at the cavern. Listen, Lexi. Thinking about it isn't going to do either of us any good. Just uh, try to keep it in the back of your mind, okay? Come on. I want to show you something. I got up, Sans grabbed my hand, and we were off to whatever wonderful surprise that he had in store for me. Personally, I don't hate this chapter. I thought it got kind of confusing when once I started talking about the 237th time, because it got a little weird, like, where, which place we were at, and, like, this being the final battle and all, I think it could have been more concrete and more understandable. But other than that, I didn't... I was fine reading it. I didn't think it was too bad. So we will go on to the next chapter. Oh, yay. I have my author's note in here about Sans being in the story a lot. So let's, let's read that before we get into my uh, the rest of it. Yes, I do understand that Sans is in this story a lot. There, and it's not because of my unoriginal thought of Sans being my favorite character, Sans is not in this story because of this. The reason behind this, him being in the story a lot, is because of the route I'm taking for this story. With the story being focused on the fact that Undertale is a game, Sans is the only character that understands this fact fully. I just want people to know that Sans isn't in this story for any romantic purposes whatsoever. With a lot of guys that are either characters in a game or that I watch on YouTube, I do not see I see them in a romantic way. I see these people as friends, a group that I can just sit down and casually play video games with or, and just have a good time being me. Sorry for the ramble, I just wanted to let you guys know. Now back to the story. Uh, this is still true to me. I don't, like if I watch a YouTuber or something like that, uh, in the beginning, I'll be honest, I was very, very cringy with wanting to marry them. But I kind of quickly grew out of that. Like, I realized how messed up it was and kind of just changed my mindset. And I think they're all really cool. And then just like the same with Sans. Sans is a really cool guy. He Sure, he has like a weird, tragic backstory. And that's an interesting thing. But, um, 
I still would imagine telling jokes left and right or playing video games or playing pranks on papyrus or something like that. Anyway, let's read the re this little itty bitty chapter and we will be closing up with my final thoughts from this episode. When we arrived, we were back at the void. Why are we back here? I asked. Sans answered in silence, still holding on to my hand. He started walking, pulling my arm. We walked for quite some time until we saw figures in the distance. I was shocked at what I saw. It was Undyne, Papyrus, Toriel, and all the monsters that Kara has killed along their path. I started running, practically dragging Sans behind me. I was so happy to see them. Sans got his bearings and brought me to a stop. They can't see you, he said sadly. They're an active code. I gave him a questioning expression. Look, since Kara killed them in the game, these character models are inactive. If this world is erased by Kara, they will be erased and new character models will be brought to, in to replace them. This is how the models retain their memories of timelines. They'll just keep these memories until the player beats the true path this route or erase them completely when Kara moves, removes this timeline out of existence in the genocide route. What about you? I asked. He sighed. Due to the fact that I am both inactive code and active code, depending on where I am, I don't get erased. I remember everything that happens during every timeline that a human is here, genocide or not. Every time Kara is here, I think that if I kill them enough times, they'll just stop, though. That thought drives me insane. Like I said, thinking about it isn't going to help me. I just have to keep doing it for them. That's all I can do now. But, uh, but you being here can give me a new opportunity to beat that monster once and for all. He squeezed my hand as hard as he could. Come on, let's go see where that twerp is. I'm probably near the core by now. And we were off to our next destination. One thing that I still, I know I bring this up a lot in like pretty much every episode here, that Sans assumes that I know what's going on. I kind of, I'm glad that he's like explaining it and I have this thing in here that I wrote. But at the same time, I feel like he wouldn't be saying it if he didn't think I would be brought back or something. Then, because he doesn't know that I remember stuff yet. So, I feel like if he thinks this would happen again, then he wouldn't be saying all this information. But at the same time, I do appreciate that he's saying it and that I'm trying to give something interesting in this. Anyway, that is going to be it for this lovely video. We still have two chapters left, I think. Yes, two more chapters. A Watcher's Perspective and Oddly Unpredictable. And uh, we'll do that not next week, but the week after, as the other ones have been every other week. So if you want to look forward to that and go watch that when it comes out, please subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to be told about that. If you want to watch any of my other videos, I have a couple that you may watch at your own discretion. And uh, I think that's going to be it for this video. Any comments are appreciated. And let me know what I can do to make your experience more enjoyable. And I will see you guys next time.